Welcome to the YouTube channel for Sunset Canyon Baptist Church. My name is Russell Dixon and I have the privilege of serving as the senior pastor here. You know, the only way we can bring messages like the one you're about to watch, both to our YouTube channel and to our podcast is through the generosity of not only our church family, but also of you, our extended family. So if you would like to contribute to help support the work that God is doing through this ministry financially, you can go to our website at sunsetcanyonchurch.org and simply click on the button that says give. We hope that this week's message encourages you to seek Jesus, and we pray that it helps you to grow in your walk with Him. Now, here's this week's message. met my wife, the year was 2013, and we did not start dating until 2015. You might be saying, Russell, what on earth took you so long? Well, I met her at kids camp. She was on kids ministry staff at our previous church. She had started working there in March of 2013, and I went as a counselor to kids camp as I was interviewing to come on staff. And so it was kind of my last working interview before I came on staff at the church there. And her boss at that time was kind of a mentor of mine, and he was kind of trying to give her the, eh, eh, like, take an interest in him, are you interested? And she said that part of the reason why she kept her distance from me was because the first time she laid eyes on me, I had about 10 fourth graders around me, and I was going, na 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 And you would think that a kid's minister at heart would have thought, oh, wow, he's great with kids. And she said, no, he was enjoying it way more than they were. She said, I did not sign up to be somebody's mom. I want to be somebody's wife. And so because of that, she kept her distance from a season. And then apparently is somewhere between that experience and 2015, she started to develop an interest from afar. But every time I saw her, she would run the other direction like a fourth grade girl with a crush would. And so we both had misperceptions. I thought she wasn't interested in me. She thought I wasn't interested in her. And how many of you know that oftentimes misperceptions can cause us to keep our distance from people, places, or things, right? I'll use another example. When I was a kid, we went to Disney World, and we, I, I am not a roller coaster person. How many of y'all like roller coasters? Okay, you are brave people. I'm not a roller coaster person. Like, I consider the teacups a roller coaster at Disney World, okay? And so my parents take us on the Pirates of the Caribbean, okay? And if you've ever been to Disney World, you know that at the Pirates of the Caribbean, there is a drop at the beginning. I say drop in, in quotes, okay? There's a drop. Now, when you're seven years old, that feels terrifying. You know, my parents are like, it's fine. It's not a roller coaster. It's fine. Yo, ho, yo, ho, a pirate's life for me, right? So they're, they're like, it's fine. Well, of course, I'm terrified because I felt like this drop was like coming off of Mount Everest. And so flash forward to when I'm 21, 22, we go back to Disney World, and my parents are literally dragging me to go on to Pirates of the Caribbean saying, you are a grown man. You can do this, okay? You can do this. What's my point? Well, oftentimes, misperceptions or bad experiences not only cause us to keep a distance, but many times we have to have people come beside us to help us re-engage, right? And I think that for many of us, the same thing is true with the church. That many people, unfortunately, oftentimes have misperceptions of the church. Maybe they have a bad experience. Maybe they encounter something that didn't go the way they wanted it to, and because of that, they keep their distance, and they need people to come beside them to help them be able to re-engage. Barna did a study within the last few years, and here's what they found in the study. It said, 
a large majority of the nation's unchurched population is drawn from the sector comprised of people who consider themselves to be Christian. And then it goes on to say, most unchurched people, more than four out of five, were formerly regular participants in church life, many of whom departed after an ugly incident that hurt them deeply. And it would go on to say, in a 2019 unchurched report by Billy Graham Center Institute and Lifeway Research, they basically kind of analyzed this data above further that we just talked about, and it says that a little over a third of the people who used to attend church now stay away specifically because they lost trust in God, lost trust in the church, or lost trust in Christians. And then what's even more scary is it would go on to say the number of Americans ages 18 to 29 who have no religious affiliation has nearly quadrupled in the last 30 years. Scary for the future of the church, isn't it? That 59% of millennials that were raised in a church have now dropped out. Warren Cole Smith, who's the president of this organization called Ministry Watch, he would comment on all of this data. All of this I found was from one article And he said it this way, for centuries, Americans have seen Christians and the church as a positive influence in the world. He says that's no longer the case. Today, the church in America is facing a credibility crisis. In 1975, Gallup said that 68% of Americans have a great deal or quite a lot of confidence in the church or an organized religion. And then Gallup's 2019 survey found that number had dropped down to 36%. Now, my question is, why are people losing trust in the church? This is where I'm going to ask for some audience participation here. If you've spent any time in church, you're going to know exactly where I'm going. So take your hands like this. Everybody, everybody, we're all doing this, okay? Bring your hands together and go like this. You know where I'm going? This is the church. Let's repeat after me. This is the church. This is the steeple, open it up, and you see all the people. People are losing trust in the church because the church is run by sinful and broken people. And how many of you know that hurt people hurt people? That no matter how well-intentioned we are, many times when we have been broken, we unintentionally hurt other people as well. The church is an organization that's run by sinful people, but we worship a sinless Savior. And that is the difficulty that people have trouble reconciling. So today, as we continue this message series called Next Level, I want to talk to you from this thought of people and steeples, meaning why are so many people that have been hurt by the church staying away, and how can we as a church better be able to engage people that are staying away from the church. You can see a lot of people have misperceptions. How many of you have heard the the misperception that everyone in church is pious, right? They're a bunch of religious people. They're a bunch of know-it-alls. They think they're smarter than everybody. I've heard that, that thought pattern before. I've also heard that everyone in church is perfect, right? They have everything together, even in their Hawaiian shirt. They just look so nice and put together, and they just don't have anything wrong, and Yet, so many times, all we need to do is peek back behind the curtain of people's lives, and we know we all have our stuff going on. Amen? And, so, and then some people stay away because of preferences. Well, that church doesn't do the thing that I want, or they did do that thing that I, I do not like and I can't stand. And so because of that, we say, that's it. Church is not for me at all. And then finally, sometimes people perceive church people to be pushy, that even though as Christians we're called to be bold with the gospel, many of us don't know how to walk in that delicate tension of being bold with the gospel, but also not cramming it down people's throats and being religious and pious. And so today, what we're going to do is we're going to look to Acts chapter 2. If you have a Bible, go ahead and turn there. And we're going to camp out on verses 42 through 47, because this is a picture of the early church. And I believe that if we as a church and the capital C church strives to model ourselves after this early church, then I believe that hopefully we will be a people that can help reverse the perception that many people have. Because many people are saying, I'm, I'm done with church, I'm out on it, 
I'm not getting involved. And the only way we can continue to reach this rapidly growing community is if all of us take ownership in the mission. I want to give you a quick background of the book of Acts before we dive in. So the book of Acts was written by Luke. Many people, how many of you ever heard uh, that the Apostle Paul wrote the most of the New Testament? Everybody, anybody ever heard that before? That's partially true. So the reason why it's only partially true is he wrote the most number of letters or most number of books, but word for word, Luke actually wrote most of the New Testament. Because when you put Luke and Acts together, just in two books, that actually comprises slightly more than half of the New Testament. And so what we see in Acts chapter 1 is Jesus is giving his disciples the final charge. He's about to go up into heaven, and he says, but you will receive power. That word you, it doesn't say uh, only those who work for the church. It doesn't say only if you work for FCA. It doesn't say only if you are a deacon. It doesn't say, it's, that is you, if you are a Jesus follower and you have received the Holy Spirit, you have the power of the living God inside of you. And that because of that, we are to go out into the world to make disciples. And then in Acts chapter 2, Peter gets up and preaches the first sermon, and it says that 3,000 people were saved that day. And then it brings us to verses 42 through 47, which is where we see this great picture of what the early church looked like. And so I want to point out three things that I think will help us as we seek to engage our community and engage people that are probably keeping a distance from church right now. Uh, before we dive in, I want to give you the main thought. If you've got a listener guide, wave it in the air like you just do care. All right, main thought is this. The church, capital C Church, can bring hope and healing. Y'all say hope. Y'all say healing. Instead of hurt, when it operates how God designed it to operate. Now, quick caveat, that doesn't mean that we all have to like stay in the first century times. Like That doesn't mean that technology is bad. That doesn't mean that we have to go first century times. The, the, the methods of ministry have adapted throughout the years. Thank God for technology. I see some people in this room that know Jesus today because of technology. It's amazing, right? So I'm not saying that we have to only do things exactly how the early church did them. The method of ministry changes, but the message never changes. And so that's what we're going to look at today is what was the message and how did they strive to live in the early church? The first thing that they did is in the early church, it was a place they went to seek God's presence. Y'all say seek. So in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says this, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. So in the early church, they would gather as a means to seek God's presence. Now you might be thinking, well, wait a minute. If we're a Jesus follower, the church is not the only place that we can encounter God's presence. And if you're thinking that, you are in fact correct. If you remember in the New Testament when Jesus was crucified, the veil in the temple was torn in two. And the symbolism of that was powerful because all leading up to Jesus' sacrifice, the children of Israel had to be separated from the presence of God. The Holy of Holies contained the presence of God, and it was only one day a year the high priest would go in on the Day of Atonement to atone for the sins of the people. But because of Jesus' sacrifice, that veil being torn in two now meant that we have full access to the presence of the living God. So that when we come into relationship with Jesus, we are living tabernacles. Isn't that good news? That when we leave here, we have just as much access to God. However, when we come here, we encounter God's presence in ways that we don't often encounter God's presence out there. Amen? That something happens in this space that doesn't happen in other spaces. That's why in Hebrews chapter 10 it says, And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do. So I want to pull out a couple of principles, a couple of things that the early church did in these verses, ways that they encountered God through the gathering. The first way was that they encountered God through the scriptures. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Now, I would certainly encourage you, if you're not having a regular quiet time where you're reading the word on your own, 
that's obviously something we would encourage you to do as a church. I mean, that's kind of Christianity 101. So you might be thinking, well, yes, can I read the scriptures on my own? Yes, thanks to Martin Luther, we can now read the scriptures on our own. However, we also have an interaction around God's word at church that we don't often have when we read it privately because we have somebody that's walking beside us to teach us the scriptures. That's why it's so important, whether it's from this platform or in our connect classes, that we spend time preparing to rightly divide God's word. Now, I'm going to take it a step further and talk about our connect classes. Something happens in this space where you're hopefully being taught God's word. Every now and then we have good preaching. It's usually when we have a guest or somebody like that. But And it's important because we want to, and I I spend a lot of time trying to prepare to make sure that we rightly divide the word from this platform. However, the next step in our church is what we call our connect classes. It's what, for many of you that grew up in church, called Sunday school, right? And that is a place where we get deeper into the word and deeper into community. A lot of churches nowadays have gone away with the Sunday school model. And I personally think it's crazy. And here's why. How many young families we got in our room? Raise your hand. If you have kids in the home, still high school or down. Okay, we've got a few. How many of you would think that it's challenging to try to have a group, a connect class in your home during the week when toddlers are running around crazy screaming? And all of God's people said, amen. The only time it would work for us is if the lesson was on sin. And I was like, here you go. It's right here. Original sin. Didn't have to teach them how to do that, right? And so, so I say that because I find that it's a lot easier to give up one more hour on a Sunday to get involved in a smaller group than it is to try to do something during the week. Now, that's also for that stage of life. We do have offerings on uh, weeknights as well. And so at the end of today's service, we're going to have a representative from all of our different Connect classes. They're, they're broken out kind of by stage of life. We have a men's class We have a ladies' class, we have a Kaya class, which is kind of like a ladies' class, just in a slightly different stage. And then we have three classes that are kind of in the, mostly in the married stage of life. We have the Forge, which is our wisest class here as a church. Uh, Then we have Life 2.0, which is kind of what it sounds like. It's empty nesters, early empty nester stage. And then Thrive is basically, there we go, we got some noise for Thrive. It's basically young adults and couples with kids that are kind of still high school on down. And so let me encourage you, coming to church is great, but if you want to grow deeper in the scriptures, take that next step. Here's another reason why. In a gathering of this size, even though we're a small church, if we tried to have discussion right now, number one, most of us would be terrified, you know, if if you felt, if you got called out, public speaking is people's number one fear. Uh, Also, that would take like 16 hours, right? Right? if we try to just let everybody discuss in here. And so in connect classes, it's a place where we interact around the word. It's not just sermon A and sermon B. It's a place where we have discussion. Now, if you go to a connect class, they're not going to call you out and say, tell me to exegete the book of Leviticus, okay? Hopefully they're not doing that. If they do, let me know, and we'll have a sidebar conversation, okay? But it's, it's a way where you can discuss and interact around the word Uh, that you can't do normally in the church gathering. We also have life groups. I know many of you are in life groups. We have the Sawyers and the Up Churches. And then starting Wednesday nights this fall, we've had kids and youth programming going on. We also have a class called Women's Wednesday. And then we're going to be kind of restarting a Wednesday night Bible study that's kind of for everybody else. And so those are great spaces as well, especially if you're serving during the Connect Hour or you're not able to get into a Connect class. But let me encourage you, please, 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 I promise you, if you make that commitment this time of year to take that next step and get involved, God will do great works in your life. So they they studied scripture. The next thing they did was they had fellowship. Y'all say fellowship. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. Now, here's the beauty of the connect classes. Not only do they study the word together, they also do life together. That's what the early church did. They ha- our, our connect classes have Christmas parties and social events and different things where we can literally share life with one another. And another step that they talked about in the early church is they shared meals together. I won't spend a ton of time there because we did a whole series called Dinner with Jesus back before Easter. If you missed it, go back on our YouTube page and watch it. 
But that's a part of how we do life as a church together. The early church devoted themselves to prayer. Y'all say prayer. We have a a prayer ministry that our deacons, you can uh, write prayer requests and either keep them confidential or you can share them. And we make a commitment as a staff and through our deacon body to pray over those things every single week. And then finally, uh, this is, some of us are more excited about this than others, the early church committed to singing. And it says in Acts 2, uh, 47, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And we make a joyful noise, emphasis on joyful. It's not always a great noise. There's a reason why I'm not on the praise team. But that's why, as a church, we commit to those things. So my question is, as we look at that list, think about your life and ask yourself this question, what is missing from my life in that list? What's missing from my life in that list? Because many people hit a place of spiritual stagnation, right, where they feel like God doesn't feel as near as he once did, and I would encourage you to evaluate and say, am I doing these things that the early church did as well? So not only was it a place to seek God's presence, the next thing that it was was it was a place to see his work, it was a place of support, and it was a place of service. Y'all say service. So it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 43 through 45, it says, Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And then it said, All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had a need. So as the early church did the things we just talked about, what happened was they saw God move in their midst. And if you see what they're saying, they didn't just have a ho-hum mentality about what God was doing. I think one of the problems of the early church, or not the early church, the church, the modern church, is that we don't celebrate enough the miracles that God is doing. Isn't it miraculous when you see dead people come to a life in Christ? When you see people that are broken and hurting, and God turns their life around and restores them. That's why I'm thankful to be a part of a church that doesn't just say, oh, well, someone gave their life to Jesus. No, we celebrate and we rejoice over every person that repents and gives their life to Jesus. I'm thankful to be a part of a church that's like that, aren't you? Amen? And so we have to continue to do that. So the first thing they did was they marveled. In other words, they stopped and said, wow, God, look at what you're doing. You're doing a miraculous work. They marveled. But they also ministered. And as they marveled, they would rejoice and it would give them the fuel they needed to go out and to minister. Notice that it says they were all together and they had everything in common. What does that mean? The Greek word they use there is this word koina. Y'all say koina. K-O-I-N-A. It it also translates into this other word called koinonia. This concept that we have for getting along together, if you will. But what's interesting about the word koina, several places when it's used in the New Testament, it actually can be translated to mean impure. So what does that mean? What does it mean when they were all together and had everything in common? It means that they all realized none of us have it figured out. Isn't that what's crazy? Why so many people say the church, they're just a bunch of perfect people. No, we are not. We are all broken. We're all sinful. And that early church realized, man, my brokenness is different than your brokenness, but we all have it together in common. Why? Because the church is a hospital for sinners and not a country club for saints. We are all in this together. We're all a work in progress. And they shared each other's burdens. I want to illustrate it like this. So I hopefully... You've been looking at this, trying to figure out what on earth this is. No, we're not having a workout class. So uh, how many of you were here Christmas Eve? Anybody remember Christmas Eve? All right, we got two people. Great. That's awesome. Come Christmas Eve. Um, I know it's a while, but I talked about the gift of Jesus on Christmas Eve. And I would say that not only is a personal relationship with Jesus a gift, but his church is also a gift. How many of you are thankful that you have a church that supports you and walks beside you and cares for you? Amen. Yes. A lot of us wouldn't be, I know I would not be standing today if it were not for the local church. So this is going to represent the local church. 
Now, this is what we call in the South, we call this a lever. Y'all say lever, a.k.a. a lever. But if you're from the South, you know it's not lever, it's lever, right? So in a lever, you've got your load, you've got your fulcrum, and you've got your effort, right? Now, here's what this is going to represent. The church represents this, this part right here. This represents our life. For some of us, it might as well be 100 pounds, right? Like, life just happens to us. And here's what happens. For a lot of people, we think, man, those church people, they are so perfect. I mean, they have their whole lives together, and so I want to keep the church as far away from my mess as possible. I don't want them anywhere near. I don't want them to know what's going on. And here's what happens when we do that. When we keep the church away from us, good luck, right? We can't lift our burdens. However, what Luke's telling us about that early church is that when we realize, you know what? None of us have it together. We all have our stuff and we all have our issues. And so I'm going to let the church get all up in my life. And when we do that, watch what happens. We can carry our burdens. We can take it one step at a time, knowing that we have people there to care for us. So my question to you is, do you allow people in your life like that? And are you pursuing other people to bring them into our community? And then, so not only did they support each other, they also served. Y'all say serve. It says they sold their possessions. In other words, they met needs around them. Billy Graham said it this way, the highest form of worship is the worship of unselfish Christian service. In other words, as we serve, we are worshiping God. The greatest form of praise is the sound of consecrated feet seeking out the lost and helpless. Rick Warren would say it this way, faithful servants never retire. You can retire from your career, but you will never retire from serving God. Now, I'm gonna press in a little bit here. Might stomp on some toes, so if you're limping out of here, I apologize, I love you. Many of us in our church have been faithfully serving for a long time. I see a lot of people that your backs are probably hurting because you've been carrying this church for many years. And if that's you, I want to say thank you. Not only do I want to say thank you, I want all of us to give a great big round of applause for those people that have been here through the thick and the thin and have faithfully, faithfully served. Now, for the rest of us, as we talked about last week, by God's grace, we've seen him move in mighty ways in our church in the last few years, amen? We have 130 now new members in the last two years. It's amazing. Now, I put myself in this group because I'm still the new guy. For those of us that are new, and if we're not consistently serving in some way, you're missing out on what God has for your life. I'm just telling you, you are missing out on what God wants to do. And here's why that's important. You remember that stat about millennials leaving the church? If we want to see the church carry forward, and I mean the capital C church. I'm not talking about Sunset Canyon. I'm talking about the capital C church. Then we, especially this new generation, millennials down, we have to step up. We've got to step up. We've got to be ready to carry the torch. Why? Because Something happens in my life and in your life when we serve. When we get outside of ourselves and we realize, I'm not in it only for me, I'm here to serve others. Now, you may have health reasons. You may have something. I'm not saying you've got to be here every time the doors open. I know some of our folks around here, if you didn't know any better, you would think they were on staff, right? They're here all the time. And and if that's you, thank you. Praise God for what you're doing. Keep doing it. But if you're not serving in some small way consistently, let me just tell you, it's not that I'm concerned about the future of our ministries. You know why? If God brought us through a pandemic, he'll bring us through anything. Amen? So God's got this church, but I want to make sure you are experiencing the fullness of what he has for your life. There's something that happens when we serve other people. Really quickly, you might be going, okay, you got me. My toes are hurting. I'm good. How can I serve? A couple of quick ways. Number one, serve on a greeting team. It's one of the simplest ways to make this place friendly, to make this place welcoming. Um, All right, audience participation, go like this, okay? All right, go like this, and then say, hi, how are you? Okay, you qualified for the greeting team. Congratulations. 
all right? As long as you don't snarl and bark at people, you can be a greeter, okay? It's, it's really simple, okay? So that's a great place. Connect classes. We talked about them already. They, these are facilitated. We don't have staff members in every class. They're run by our church, and there's ways for you to serve within those classes. We'll have leaders down front at the end. You can serve on a committee. It's a great way to use your gifts. The nominating committee nominates members of our church to serve there. You can serve with events and hospitality. These tables and chairs that are in the gym, I know it's surprising, but they didn't just magically set up that way. Carter Blackburn didn't come in and go, ta-da! Like, people actually set those up. And so you can serve in that way. You can serve with following up with people in our church. This is something we're going to be, as we start this Wednesday night Bible study, we're going to put together a in-reach outreach team. Basically, it's looking out for people when they go MIA. Because how many of you know that when people go MIA, usually something's going on in their life, right? Just like we illustrated there, when they distance themselves from the church, it's not that we're following up with people so we have higher attendance. I could care less about that. What I do want to see is people knowing that there's a church there that cares for them, even in their broken places and broken spaces. Another way is the care team. So the care team has a couple arms. They have hospital visits. You may be going, no, thank you. I'm good. I'll pass out. Can't do that. That's fine. You can also uh, participate in the meal making part of our, our care team. When people have a child or they, they go to the hospital or something like that, you can help participate in that way. So consider the ways you might serve. Why? Because serving and supporting others through the local church is a great recipe to see God work. As you get outside yourself and I get outside myself, we see God move in our midst. How might God be calling you to serve this year? So we've seen the first two ways. The final way is perhaps the most important and that the early church was a place of salvation. Salvation. Y'all say salvation. It says in Acts chapter 2, verse 47, and the Lord added to their number, what does that word say? Daily, those who were being saved. Okay, I want to talk about that very briefly. Quick theological lesson. There is a difference when you read the Bible in something that is descriptive and something that is prescriptive. You might be going, you, had me, you, let, you lost me at theological. Let me make this really simple, okay? So descriptive means when it's describing something that happened, prescriptive means, hey, this is the way that it should be. Now, this is a place that is describing what happened in that early church. However, when you look at other passages about the early church, people were kind of coming, know, coming to know the Lord in droves, weren't they? That people were getting saved. Why? Because the gospel is alive and active. Amen? And so a healthy church should see people that are being saved. Churches that are healthy, they keep the Great Commission not as a side street, but as the forefront of everything they do. There's a guy named Tom Rader that wrote a couple books on uh, the anatomy of churches, and he studied churches that died, he studied churches that revived, and then he studied churches that were thriving. And in his book on, it's called Autopsy of a Deceased Church. I know that it sounds depressing, but that's the reality, okay? The pandemic... A lot of churches close their doors. By God's grace, not only are we open, but we are thriving by God's grace. He said this, thriving churches have the great commission as the centerpiece of their vision, while dying churches have forgotten the clear command of Christ. So they have the centerpiece. It's the very focal point. And then he goes on to say in another book on the anatomy of the revived church, he would ask this question. Here's a question with an obvious answer. Do you think it's important for churches to be reaching people in their communities with the gospel? Would you agree with that? Of course you do, is what he says. We should be. And then he goes on to say, the churches that revived, they, 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 kept, they, they followed along with what was happening. Okay? It says, here's another question. Do you know how many people God converted through the ministries of your church in the last year? Five years ago. He goes on to say, let me make some points perfectly clear. We do not count for bragging rights. We count for accountability. We count for obedience. It's simply a way of keeping our priorities in front of us. It's about keeping the main things the main things. And so a lot of times when you hear 15 students came to Christ in an event, we have a tendency to go, ugh, 
ugh, why, why are we talking about that? It's because those are people with a life, with a soul, with an eternity. And that matters deeply to God. And if it matters deeply to God, it should matter to us. Amen? And so I'm going to take this a step further. A lot of people say, all right, you know, I, I, need, to, I need to be about salvation. I'm going to go on a mission trip. How many of you have ever been on a mission trip before? Whether international, statewide, okay? It's a great thing. I've been on one. But here's what I would challenge you with. Mission trips are great, but why go on a mission trip halfway around the world when we can go on a mission trip all the way across the street? That God is bringing the world to our doorstep and we can reach our neighbors just as easily. Many churches have the expectation for their staff or their deacons to do all of the ministry, right? If you have some sort of spiritual title, committee leaders to do all the ministry. And Tom Rainer would say it this way, too many churches see the pastor or staff or deacons as the one who does all the ministry instead of the ones who equip people to do the work of the ministry. The Great Commission doesn't give a caveat only to people who've signed up to be on some position of spiritual leadership. It's for everybody. There are over a million people a month literally saying, churches near me. They're searching for the hope of the gospel. Let us be a people who are a part of that work. Amen? So let me make it clear. God does the work, but we have work to do as well. And I'm thankful to be a part of a church who is stepping into that mission and participating in it consistently. I want to close our time together today by sharing a brief testimony video of somebody that you're going to recognize immediately. And what you'll hear in his story is how the church pursued him when he was far away from God and what God did in his life. Check it out. Hello guys, my name is Parker Johnson and I would like to share a quick story with y'all. Um, I recently got saved about a month ago and I would like to walk y'all through my story. So in about May, I was having a lot of questions about the Bible and God in general and through that I had uh, the urge to find a church near me in Dripping Springs and when I did that I found Sunset Canyon and I noticed that they had a live stream and I, after watching for a couple weeks I finally found the courage to come here and I remember just the first week just being welcomed and treated so nicely and I just kept coming and through that I just I felt myself becoming closer with Christ and and finally accepting my Lord and Savior and being baptized in the same week. And I can't describe like the feeling of that. And just through, through the pursuit of this church, I've become so much closer with God and everyone has helped me and welcomed me. And it's just a blessing. Amen. Did you hear what he said? Through the pursuit of this church, God did the work in his life. God is the one who does all the work. We know that. But what a blessing that he uses us. None of us are qualified. None of us. No matter how many degrees, no matter how many letters after our last name, we are not qualified, but God uses us. He's just an example of one of a million people every month in the country who are searching for hope. So as we go out from here, let us remember that we're going on mission. My question that I'll leave you with today is how can God use you to help change someone's life? God changes their life, but he uses you and me. How can we change their view of Jesus and change their view of the church forever? Amen?